Assalamu alaikum. My presentation today is going to be about the bronchial asthma. It's going to be presented by Amal of Madison on the 30th of August 2013. So uh, these are the objectives that I'm going to be covering throughout this presentation. To start with, we have to understand what is asthma. You have to keep in mind that asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways and the lungs, and this disorder is going to be caused by many cells and cellular elements, for example, the Th2 cells, the mast cells, the eosinophils, and so on. Also, this chronic inflammatory disorder is going to be accompanied by hyperresponsiveness. Hyperresponsiveness is going to cause a bronchospasm, and this is going to be the key element behind the signs and symptoms of asthma, such as wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and coughing, which particularly happens at night or in the early morning. Another thing to keep in mind in regards to asthma, that it's going to be a chronic inflammatory disorder, which is going to be accompanied by widespread yet variable airway obstruction. And this airway obstruction is usually reversible, and it could be reversible either spontaneously or uh, with treatment. Now, why is asthma a very important disease, and why should we spot some light on asthma? This is basically regards to the epidemiology of asthma. When we come to talk about the epidemiology of asthma, you have to remember that there is about 300 million individuals in this world that are suffering from this disease. And recently, it has been reported that about 250,000 individuals have died due to this condition. Now, the fact that the prevalence of asthma is really increasing in the world in a very dramatic way is an issue. But when then we come to a very important issue to keep in mind, that as long as this disease is there, then this is going to create a very large burden on the healthcare delivery system. And why is that? Because lots of health care is needed for these asthmatic patients to control their condition, and more importantly, many expenses and financial issues are going to act as a burden on both healthcare individuals and the patients themselves. Therefore, you have to keep in mind that asthma is really increasing in prevalence in the world and it's causing a real burden on our societies. What is the etiology of asthma and how could we classify asthma? Usually asthma is going to be classified into two categories. It could be either extrinsic asthma or intrinsic asthma. Now the extrinsic asthma is going to be allergic or atopic asthma, meaning that it's going to be due to the allergy of the individual towards particular um, allergens, for example, pollens, for example, some kind of drugs, some kind of, um, some kind of plants, and so on. In these individuals, usually the presentation is going to be that the child, that the patient is going to be a child, so the presentation is within childhood. You could see a positive family history. Of, um, of such diseases or at least such symptoms and the individual himself or herself might be suffering of other allergies like for example you can see some atopic dermatitis which is eczema in the individual besides to the fact that the individual is suffering from asthma and other allergic manifestations could be possible to be seen regarding the intrinsic asthma intrinsic asthma is the non-allergic asthma or the non-atopic asthma which is usually not associated with allergies. So uh, if we did the skin allergy test for individuals who have intrinsic asthma, it's going to be negative unless the extrinsic where the skin allergy, allergy test is going to be positive. On the other hand, in intrinsic asthma, the patients are going to be represent most commonly due to childhood. Now, there are other classifications of asthma. For example, there is exercise-induced asthma, occupational asthma, and aspirin-induced asthma or aspirin-associated asthma. Um, Exercise-induced asthma could be like these three other categories. They are sometimes um, categorized under the intrinsic asthma, although some other books might classify them as separate classifications. Um, but we can mention them. The exercise-induced asthma is going to be um, some some patients might experience some signs and symptoms of freezing, coughing, and chest tightness and breathlessness during exercise, or after exercising, like for ten minutes, they might have these signs and symptoms. Um, occupational asthma are usually uh, for patients who have lots of exposure uh, to industrial uh, industrial pollutions or industrial substances, like for example, patients who work in industrial uh, societies. They might have some exposure to some certain kind of chemicals or some certain kinds of gases, and therefore they're going to be suffering of occupational asthma. And the third type is aspirin-induced asthma, because some patients might develop uh, this kind of asthma after an administration of aspirin or administration of any other drug. 
Um, so this is basically the etiology of asthma. Uh, how could we know that this patient is going to be having asthma or what are the basic factors that are going to uh, lead to the development and to the expression of asthma? Uh, one of the most important factors to keep in mind is going to be the genetic factor. More than 100 genes have been identified to be responsible for the development of asthma in individuals. Now, these genes are going to be the genes that are particularly important in the role of the interleukins and the inflammatory modulators and the inflammatory cells and so on. So, these genes are going to be the ones responsible for these substances and these mediators that are going to cause the uh, occurrence of asthma. Other thing is going to be gender. Gender plays a very important role in determining if this individual is going to be suffering with asthma or not. It has been found that during childhood, males are more affected than females, whereas after puberty, females are more affected than males. Environmental factors like indoor and outdoor allergens, occupational sensitizers that are also common in patients who have occupational induced asthma, air pollution, tobacco smoke, respiratory infections, and diet. These are the, 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 um, the factors that are going to be responsible for determining asthma itself. But what can exacerbate asthma? Like for example, let's say that this patient is going to be suffering from asthma, but what can really cause this patient an asthmatic attack? Uh, of course, allergen, like for example, if the patient has been um, exposed to some kind of stuff that he's all already allergic towards, then this is going to cause an, an exacerbation of asthma. Respiratory infections, like the respiratory sensitive virus and influenza, play a very important role in exacerbating asthma. Exercise, weather changes, and also there's something that you have to keep in mind, that uh, emotional distress and emotional depression can cause exacerbation of asthma. Um, now we want to understand the pathophysiology of asthma and how does asthma occur. If you want to talk about the occurrence of asthma, then usually asthma is going to be divided into three phases. Early phase, late phase, and um, the third phase, which we're going to be talking about now. If you want to talk about the early phase, I'm going to be talking about the extrinsic asthma. When the allergen is going to be introduced to the body, it's going to be identified as an antigen. And this antigen is going to elect a Th2 response in the body. The Th2 response is going to create the production of lots of eosinophils and the production of lots of IgE cells. Now these IgE cells are going to be binding to the mast cells. After they bind to the mast cells, they're going to release lots of mediators. These mediators are going to include lots of cells, like for example, the interleukins and the histamines. Histamines cause bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction. These mediators are going to try to um, like loosen up or break up the tight junctions between the epithelial cells so that they can have access inside the cell. Once they have access inside the cell, they activate the mast cells, the mucosal mast cells. And these mucosal mast cells are going to release more interleukins and more inflammatory mediators, leading to increase in the cellular infiltrate, increase in the inflammatory mediators, and therefore increase in the inflammation. Now, by the end of the early uh, phase, we're going to be having mucosal edema, vascular permeability, and we're going to have bronchospasm. The exact mechanism of bronchospasm that happens during asthma is not very well understood. Yet, some studies state that this bronchospasm is due to the direct action of cytokines, and other studies relate that this bronchospasm is going to be because of a neural reflex, which is going to happen because of the presence of inflammation in this part of the but so uh, after the early phase, we're going to have the late phase. In the late phase, we're going to have lots of cellular infiltrate like eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. But the eosinophils are going to play the most important role in damaging the epithelium and damaging the epithelial cells. Let's say that our patient is a chronic asthmatic patient and he has been having uncontrolled asthma for a long period of time. In this case, we're going to have another step called the airway remodeling. In the airway remodeling, we're going to have mucosal hyperplasia, we're going to have um, smooth muscles, hypertrophy, thickening, and fibrosis. Relating the pathogenesis of the disease that we just discussed to the signs and symptoms of asthma, we're going to find that the smooth muscle dysfunction causing the bronchospasm and the airway inflammation are going to play a very important role in determining the signs and symptoms of asthma. Now, in case they were prolonged, we're going to have the, the step of the airway remodeling, which is going to cause us more signs and symptoms of asthma. For example, smooth muscle hypertrophy is going to cause the chest tightness because not enough air is going to be there. We're going to have breathlessness. We're going to have wheezing sounds and so on. 
Once we understand the pathogenesis of asthma, it becomes kind of easy to diagnose a case of asthma. How could you diagnose a case of asthma? There is lots of criteria when coming to diagnose asthma. But when diagnosing any disease, you have to keep in mind that you have to take a good history, you have to do good physical examination, and then other investigations come after the physical examinations. Let's say that we have a patient suffering from asthma. What kind of complaints are we going to be hearing in the history? First of all, you have to ask about the signs and symptoms. So the patient is going to be representing with signs and symptoms of asthma, like shortness in breath, chest tightness, chest pain, coughing or wheezing, hearing some musical sounds while breathing, and so on. You have to ask about the family history, because if the patient has extrinsic asthma, then most probably the patient is going to have positive family history of the same signs and symptoms. You have to ask about allergy history because also if the patient has extrinsic asthma, it's going to be accompanied with other allergies that the patient is going to be suffering from. Proceeding to the physical findings, what kind of physical findings are you going to find in patients with asthma? You're going to see the signs of other allergies, like for example, some patients are going to have uh, atopic dermatitis, which is eczema. Um, you have to check for sinusitis because, as we said, uh, infections are going to exacerbate asthma. So infections might actually exacerbate the condition of your patient. You have to check for nasal polyps or nasal polyposis because usually asthma-induced asthma is going to be associated with nasal polyposis and nasal bleeding. And on auscultation, you're going to, to hear some wheezing sounds. Now, these wheezing sounds are going to be more commonly heard during expiration. Yet, if the patient has been uh, pro have been suffering from chronic asthma or prolonged, uncontrolled asthmatic condition, then the patient is going to be having um, this musical sound, which is the wheezing sound, on both heard on expiration and inspiration. Um, after I told you about the history and the physical findings, you might think that, okay, now these history and these physical findings may be, might be present with lots of other diseases. That's why you have to create a list in your mind of lots of differential diagnoses, and you have to eliminate them. Let's say, for example, um, some of the differential diagnoses might be allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, they're going to cause chronic cough. Um, such history might be also present in pre patients with trichomalacia. They usually... Um, present with the uh, with cough and with the uh, with chest tightness because usually they have the um, very uh, flappy cartilage that usually causes the collapse of the trachea and breathlessness and and problems in breathing uh, patients with girl GERD gastroesophageal reflex disease also may present with with lots of cough and chronic cough and, and chest tightness and so on uh, also patients that are going to be cover suffering from cystic fibrosis children that are going to be pr present with breathlessness and problems while breathing and so on so you have to eliminate these diseases. The basic criteria that you're going to be needing in order to ensure yourself that the patient is practically suffering from asthma, you need to do a spirometry. The spirometry, if you did a spirometry for the patient and you measured the FEV1 before and after bronchodilators and then you measured the difference. In case you had more than 12% difference between the FEV1 and before and after bronchodilators, you're going to find out that your patient is going to be asthmatic for sure. Now, there's a problem that you might be facing. Let's say that a patient with extrinsic asthma, a child who's less than six years old, presented to the clinic to you. How could you give him instructions for doing this biometric? It might be a really difficult job and cause you a real headache. That's why for children below the age of six, um, the diagnosis of asthma is going to be basically dependent on the signs and symptoms of coughing, wheezing, and chest tightness at night or usually in early morning, plus positive family history of similar signs and symptoms or asthma, and the allergies history of the patient himself. If you had these three criteria present in a patient below six years old, then you can easily diagnose the patient as asthma as long as you eliminate the other differential diagnosis. Um, is diagnosing asthma enough? No, it's not. You have to classify asthma and you have to classify how severe this asthma is. We basically have four categories of the severity of asthma, mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severe persistent. There are like little differences between these um, four stages to, to classify the severity. So I found this table online. This table is going to be talking about the severity of asthma and it's classifying the severity of asthma. The basic difference between uh, these four classes is basically about determining how harshly or how bad asthma alters your patient's life. 
Uh, it's due to the nighttime symptoms and the daytime symptoms. You can see here if the patient, for example, experiences the nighttime symptoms for less or two times, uh, two nights per month, then this is going to be the, night, the mild intermittent um, class. If the patient is going to undergo it for more than two nights per month, then this is going to be the mild persistent. More than one night a week, then this is going to be the moderate persistent and the frequent is going to be for uh, the severe persistent. Now, these classes are also going to be important when managing asthma. Before uh, thinking about your management of asthma, you have to know what's the exact purpose or what's the exact thing that you're trying to achieve from uh, managing your patient's condition. Uh, so, uh, there are like two types of, of um, management. You could go either to pharmacological management or non-pharmacological management. Talking about the non-pharmacological management, basically it's going to be screening for infections, for obesity. As we said, these two factors play a very important role in exacerbating asthma, so you have to be working on eliminating them. Uh, the exposure to the allergen, you're going to try to, to, to ask your patient to avoid it. If one of the parents of, your, of the child are going to be smoking, ask them to stop smoking. We have to educate them regarding uh, this issue. If they had carpet at home, they have to remove it, and so on. Pharmacological interventions include lots of kinds of and classes of, of pharmacological drugs and stuff, and of course, including immunotherapy. But these classes of drugs are basically used according to uh, what is the basic purpose that you're trying to aim after, uh, after like treating this disease. Are you trying to quickly relieve the condition of your patient or are you trying to control the condition of your patient? If you're trying to quickly relieve an accessory patient of asthma, then you're going to be using a SABA, which is a short-acting beta agonist, like for example the albuterol or the levabuterol. It usually has an onset of action of 15 to 5 hours. Or you can use an anticholinergic, which is the epiratropium. It's going to have an onset of action for four to six hours. On the other hand, you can use systemic corticosteroids. But let's put in mind that, for example, if you had a patient had, having exercise-induced asthma and you want to eliminate the signs and symptoms of wheezing, and coughing, and chest tightness that this patient might, um, might be exposed to during exercise. In this case, it's really advised to give a patient a class of a Saba and a chromalin drug 15 to 20 minutes before exercise in order to avoid any exacerbation of asthma during exercise. In order you wanted to give your patient a long-acting medication or a controller medication of asthma, in this case, you can give your patient an inhaled corticosteroid. Make sure that you give the lowest dose possible because of the side effects of the corticosteroid and you're supposed to rape spare it because you want to decrease the side effect of this um, class. Uh, you can use chromalin. Chromalin is going to be a mast cell stabilizer and therefore it's going to be helping in the early and the late phase of asthma. You can use Lucatrin modifier. You can use LABA, which is a long-acting beta agonist like the Salmeterol. You can use the Thiophelin. Thiophelin is a drug which uh, works on increasing the cyclic AMP and therefore decreasing the smooth muscle contractile. But be very sh careful while using this drug because it's going to have a narrow therapeutic index and it might have a high possibility of toxicity. And you can use the last drug, which is going to be the omalizumab. Omalizumab is going to be um, one type of the immunotherapies used in treating uh, or controlling asthma. And this drug is going to be an anti-IgE antibody, which means that it's going to prevent the IgEs from binding to the mast cells and therefore preventing the cytokine cascade and the inflammatory mediators from being released and causing the inflammation, which basically causes the signs and symptoms and complications of asthma. Um, this is also a scheme that I found online. It basically uh, summarizes the severity of asthma and what classes of drugs are you going to be using and how do you step it as well. I also would like to advise you to read the, the, the step ladder, the step up and the step down, cascade of medications and management of asthma, which is mentioned in Davidson. Um, Davidson, a medicine book of internal medicine. It's really useful to be reading. Uh, so thank you very much. This is my presentation that I had to be presenting today.